Mark chapter 8. <coughs> Last time we ended by talking about the Peter's great confession of faith. Um, how that uh, there was different ideas about who Jesus was. And uh, he asked them who that men said that he was. And uh, they told him, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, some John the Baptist. And who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter steps to the forefront and says, you, thou art the Christ. That's his office. He's the Savior. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You're the Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. His position as the Son of God, he recognized, and he called him the Son of the living God. Of course, this is Matthew chapter 16 that I'm referring to and we're in Mark, Mark's account in chapter 8, which is much more abbreviated. Um, but he called him the Son of the living God. And so he recognized that uh, there are many dead gods in the world, false idols, but uh, Jesus is the son of the living God, the one true God. And uh, so Jesus said, blessed art thou, you're, you're a blessed man, Simon, Simon Bar-Jonah, or Simon son of Jonah, or son of John. You're a blessed man, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you. It wasn't your own carnal mind that, that revealed it to you. It wasn't your cognitive ability that revealed it to you, but it was, it was uh, the Spirit of God that revealed it to you. Flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father revealed it to you, my Father which is in heaven. And so that was a, sort of that section we talked about the confession of faith as being a very important uh, section of Scripture in the New Testament, for it is the building block of the New Testament church, right? Christ is the rock, he's the cornerstone of the church. And uh, the building block of that church is a confession of faith. Someone who can say, I know, I know Christ, I know the Messiah, I know the Savior. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed it to me, but you know, the Father in heaven has revealed it to me through the, through the Spirit. Um, in that testimony of salvation, we talked about how that every person that joins the church you know, must be able to give a sound testimony of salvation. They should be able to give that publicly. And it shouldn't be scary. It shouldn't be something that they're afraid to do. It should be something that they want to do. Because God will help them do it. God will help them um, to give that, that testimony for Him. And then we start tonight in verse 31. We get into um, a sort of a, a continuation here um, shortly thereafter. Now remember, and don't forget, that Mark, Mark uh, John Mark did not walk with Jesus, but Peter did. And John Mark hung out with Peter. And so um, this is often referred to, you know, as sort of the secondhand gospel of Peter, really, is what Mark is. And so you see a lot of details about Peter here, right? A lot, Peter's the one that, see, that gives the confession. Peter's going to come to the forefront again here in this section that we talk about tonight. And he began to teach them, verse 31, he began to teach them. And so he just starts teaching them openly what? That the Son of Man must suffer many things. And be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now, he just starts talking openly about this. And I uh, notice here what he says. He says, number one, that the Son of Man must suffer. He says, number two, he must be rejected. And number three, he must be killed. Okay, and um, that's that's kind of a tough tough teaching, isn't it, for the the disciples? Because um, you know, another place he said that the disciples not above his master for whatever you know they do to the Lord, they're going to do to to the or whatever they do to the master, they're going to do to the servants. I forget exactly. I used to be able to quote that, but I don't remember exactly. It how seems it. like that fourth thing, if he will rise again, would be more difficult for them for him to teach them. In those first three, because they're already witnessing some of the things, you know, the Pharisees rejecting them. And, 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 
them thinking that he was going to were they still thinking he was going to be king and make his kingdom why they were here? Or? I think so. I, I think so, and I think that's part of the reason why he says what he says to Peter about get thee behind me, Satan. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Get there. But so this is so yeah. Thank you. There was four things there. Uh, the resurrection. So he's talking. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to resurrect. And he spoke. He spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. So he he says it openly to the whole group. But Peter says, "Hey Jesus, come on over here for a minute." Takes him off to the side. Peter did not like this message, did he? He didn't like this message. That Jesus was going to suffer and be rejected and be killed and resurrect. He didn't like that message. So the question begins, why didn't he like that message? What was, what was the issue? Well, what does he say to him? He says, when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So I had to look up that word savor there, and it means uh, to set the mind on or to think about. So what is Peter thinking about? Peter is thinking about, he's thinking about carnal things. And Jesus is thinking about what? Spiritual things. Isn't this the same problem that Jesus just asked the nine questions in the, earlier in the chapter about? Uh, the nine questions because they said, he said, beware of the leaven. And they said, oh, he's saying this because we didn't bring bread. They were thinking carnally. He's thinking spiritually. So one of the thoughts here is this, that he says, get thee behind me, Satan, because you're thinking about the things of men. Well, what was he thinking about? Well, I don't know exactly what he was thinking about, but here are some possibilities, okay? Here's some possibilities. Number one, exactly what Sister Sharon said. That Peter wanted, uh, wanted a, an earthly king to rule. And he couldn't comprehend how Jesus would rule by dying. And now the reason, that this, the reason I think that this could be a possibility is because you think about the other place we have in the scriptures where Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. And where does that occur at? Anybody remember? The, the temptations, yeah, remember the temptations of Christ, the three temptations, specifically I believe it was the last one, the last temptation where um, he, uh, Satan uh, takes him up on a high mountain, shows him all the kings of the world, and he says, you know, I'll give all these to you if you'll just bow down before me, which my understanding of that is, is he was trying to get Jesus to avoid going to the cross. Saying that you can rule and be a king over this area without, without dying, without going to the cross. And isn't that what Peter is doing right here? He's saying, no, you don't have to die. You don't have to die. You can stay here alive and be a king. And Jesus is, get thee behind me, Satan, in both of those places. Jesus' crown, his full crown, came after the cross, right? After the cross. He had to go through the cross. And so any idea that was going to have him avoid the cross is a satanic idea. It's a satanic idea. Because that's the whole reason he came into the world was to die for the sins of the people. And so uh, I believe that quite possibly an earthly king, kingly rule is one of the things that Peter may have been thinking about here. Um, I think there could have been some other things too. Like... Jesus says, I'm going to suffer. And Peter says, oh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't like that idea of suffering. And I don't like that idea of suffering for my friend. For my friend. I don't like the idea myself. And if he's going to suffer, I'm going to have to suffer. Because we hang out together. So I, I believe that it might have been, he might have been concerned about his physical safety. And the physical safety of Jesus. And I think that he was worried about his relationships. Because Jesus was his best friend. And he didn't want his best friend to die. Who wants their best friend to die? I think that he may have been worried about his own popularity. Was that something that, that, that uh, Peter showed a proclivity for? Well, how about when he denied Jesus three times? Why did he deny him? 
Well, hey, weren't you with him? You've got a Galilean accent. You certainly, I saw you with him. You were with him, weren't you? Nope, 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 nope. I wasn't with him. Um, I want to maintain my popularity. It's not popular to be so affiliated with Jesus the night of his uh, false trial and ultimately his flogging and crucifixion. It wasn't popular to be one of his friends that night. So I think that it could have been, he could have been thinking about popularity here, being rejected. He could have thought about his physical safety here, suffering or being killed. I think that several of these things could have been some of the things that Peter was thinking about. And he didn't like it when Jesus was saying, hey, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Go ahead. He walked with, with Jesus. And Jesus was telling him all this. And you would think that Peter would know and say, no, this is what's going to happen. You're not going to be that king. You're going to be the, the king of heaven. God, you're God's son. But he walked with him. And, you know, I, I, I don't, well, I, I don't say I'm not going to be this but I would think that him walking that close to Jesus, he would know. You would think, but th isn't this the same response that we can give today? I mean, Peter was a Christian. He was a saved person. And yet, in his, in his carnal thinking, he was, he was promoting a satanic idea. You see, you see what I'm saying? He, he was promoting a satanic idea. And so the idea today... When you know when we read the Bible and you read about suffering, is that a popular is that popular with you? You like that part? Matter of fact, Peter actually grew a lot. He grew a lot because when you go and read the book of First Peter, I think it has five chapters, and I believe every single chapter talks about the suffering of a Christian. I mean, when Jesus when Jesus came to Peter after his uh, post resurrection. Prior to his ascension in uh, John chapter 21. And he said, lovest thou me more than these? Three times. Yeah, yeah, Lord, you know I love you, but feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. I mean, you know, indicative of the, the reminder that you denied me three times. And here I'm having you affirm your love for me three times. I mean, Peter grew a lot between that time of the resurrection, that 40-day period. Then the 10 days from the time that Jesus ascended until the day of Pentecost, when he stepped up, stepped up at Pentecost and preached. He did a lot of spiritual growing in 50 days. He did a lot of spiritual growing. Remember? Go ahead. He told 100 church people and asked them, what do you think is a satanic thought? This is not coming up. This whole idea of just not wanting to have to suffer and not having to, to carry your own cross is not the first thing that we're going to think. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Suffering, though. Suffering's a tough one for ch children of God. You want to suffer for the cause? You want your friends not to like you? You want your, you want your neighbors not to like you? You want, you want to be rejected by the people when you stand up for the Lord in the, work, in the workplace? Do you want to be killed? Do you want to, yeah, I mean, well, we're all going to resurrect one day, but... I mean, this was not a popular message with Peter. I, I would argue it's not a popular message with the church today. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Go ahead. Yeah, if you look at the Christians that we have today, I'm speaking in general terms, we're just like Peter. I mean, we have more of a tendency to think carnally than we do spiritually. We, 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 just, we, just, we just kind of fall that way. And, and I think you see it in Christianity today. Same thing, same type of thing. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Brother Mike. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's easy for us to read it and say, oh, Peter, come on, man. But today, we have the benefit of reading the history, knowing what's happening before, during, and after, and we're still doing the same thing Peter did. So Jesus speaks it openly, Peter pulls him aside. I mean, Peter's rebuking Jesus. Think about that. He's rebuking Jesus. But now, have you ever rebuked the Lord? Have you ever gotten a little upset at what the Lord wanted you to do? I mean, I have. I have. I've, I've had to have a few a few talks with the Lord. They're talks I don't work, I don't win, but I've had to I've had to have them. I've had to have them. Have you ever had to have one? I mean, I understand, you know, I, I'm, I'm not critical of Peter because I understand, you know, that he was just being honest and sincere and direct and straightforward with how he was feeling. 
When he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter. So Peter pulls him aside, but Jesus then turns back and looks at the whole group and rebukes <laughs> Peter publicly. Why does he rebuke Peter publicly? Because he knows all things, and he knows that Peter's just a representation of what's in the hearts of all 12 of them. All 12 of them were thinking the same thing. You know, uh, Peter was, the, dare we say, Peter was the leader, if, if you want to, if you want to think of it that way. Many people do. But they were all thinking that. Get thee behind me, Satan, for you, you meditate, you uh, fix your mind on, you think about not the things of God, but the things of men. Oh, my goodness. My goodness, goodness. We do the same things, very same thing. We think about the things of men, the carnal things, and not the things of God. And that's kind of the theme of this whole chapter. And that has a spiritual effect. You know, that you, re, you, 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 you harvest what you plant. If you plant carnal, carnal reasoning and carnal thoughts, you reap that, which is not spiritual blessings, right? You don't reap spiritual blessings by planting in carnality. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And this is just like one of the most difficult scriptures we have in the whole Bible, in my opinion. I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. If you want, if you want to think about your personal living faith and your personal Christian walk, and Peter was struggling with his living faith, wasn't he? He, he got the saving faith down. He goes from this great confession of faith, right? Thou art the, cross, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? He, he has this great saving faith uh, testimony. But it gets to living faith. Suffering, being rejected and killed for the cause of Christ. And he's like, whoa, 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 I don't like that so much. Jesus, come on over here. We've got to have a talk. When he had called the people, with disciples also, he said to them, whosoever will come after me. Okay, whosoever. That means anybody, all of us. Anyone that will follow Jesus has to do what? First of all, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. That literally means what? If we what would the easiest way for us to say that is tell yourself no. He's going to have to tell himself no. <laughs> tell yourself no. If you're going to be one of Jesus' followers, you have to tell yourself no. What does that mean? Tell yourself no about what? Now think about our society, okay? And I'm not trying to be rude or, or critical or anything like that, but we have a society that statistically is becoming more and more obese, okay? So obesity, what do I do? I'm overweight. I don't tell myself no. We have a society that, has, that is in more and more debt, debt spending, credit cards, uh, houses, cars, college loans. We're in debt. What's the problem? What, what's the cause of, of, of increased debt? I can't tell myself no. So we have a society that, that is influencing all of us, and those are just two things. I mean, we could keep going on other things, too. Um, if uh, if I <laughs> have you ever said I'd love to study the Bible and pray today, but I just don't have time. What's the problem there? I don't want to tell myself no. There's some things that I need to say no to in my life so that I can make time to do what's right. Okay, so we have a society that's influencing all of us that is very very um, poor at. Us telling ourselves no. And yet Jesus says, if you're really going to serve me, you're going to have to tell yourself no. So what do you have to tell yourself no about? What do you have to tell yourself no about? Well, what, what did Peter have to tell himself no about here? What was Jesus telling him he had to tell himself no about? Anything that's against God. Anything that's against God? Suffering? Right. I mean, all this... He had to tell himself, Jesus is not an earthly king. Even though you want him to be, he, that's not why he came into the world. He came into the world to be a spiritual king. 
You know, Peter, who eventually was, history says, was crucified upside down. Peter, your physical safety, you, you may have to give that up. You may have to deny yourself your own physical safety to serve the Lord. Because the Lord might require a martyr's death from you. He required it of millions and millions during the Dark Ages, and he required it of all of the apostles except for John. So you may have to be willing to tell yourself no about your physical safety. You may have to tell yourself no about your relationships. Jesus died and went back to heaven, and you know that, that was the will of God, and you're going to have to tell yourself no. You can't have... You may not be able to have every physical you know, relationship that you want to have. You know, listen, I've, I've spent 11 years from my hometown, and my, my, I've got two little nephews that are growing up seven and eight years old. I don't even know them. I haven't spent any time with them at all. They, they, I see them like once or twice a year, and, and they're like, hey, Uncle Jason, we don't really know who you are, but we're growing up. I mean, I'd love to be part of their life. I'd love for my kids to be part of their lives, but we've had to say no to some relationships, even though we had to tell ourselves no, even though we want to say yes. Go ahead. Think about Jesus had brothers and sisters, and he's choosing to hang out with 12 men to disciple them and teach them. And he had to say no to his own relationships. Yeah, didn't spend as much time with his mother, you know, that I'm sure they would want to. Everybody wants to be liked and popular. No, nobody wants to be rejected. I mean, who, who, anybody here didn't want to be like on homecoming court when you were in high school? <laughs> Anybody? I mean, honestly, you, everybody wanted to make homecoming court. <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted to be on homecoming court. Never made it. But I wanted to be. Everybody wants to be popular, right? So, so you have to tell yourself no because if you're going to stand for the gospel, there's people who aren't going to like you. They're just not going to like you. And you just get to be okay with that. So you have to tell yourself, Peter had to tell himself no on all these things. And there are certain things that you have to tell yourself no on. You know, think about this. Um, the apostles, each one of them, the fishermen, they had to do what? Leave their jobs. What did, uh, what did um, um, the tax collector, Matthew Levi, had to leave the receipt of custom? Do you, do you think that, I mean, what they have to say? They had to say, well, you know, for our money and finances and income, we have to say no. We'd like to stay in our jobs and make as much money as we can possibly make, but this is what Jesus wants us to do. So we have to deny ourselves and tell ourselves no and, you know, go on. And so, yeah, I mean, this is, this is so hard that most people don't even really think about it. Go ahead. Well, and, and that's right. You lose control and you, you give up your rights. I like that word you use. Your rights. I heard uh, one time I remember the minister of school, Paul Bryson, was talking about that idea. But what do we hear today in our country especially? I have the right to. It's my right. My right. My right. My right. You get saved. You take your rights and you put them on the back burner. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And so, and so if you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to have to say no to some of your personal rights. Rights that other people get, but you may not. Because you may have to say no to them so that you can serve the Lord. And I mean, now we're getting down to it right here. Now this is, this is, this is, this is Christian living faith. This is the hard part. You know, you get saved. It's a gift of God. It's grace. But now we're getting to the part where each person has to do something to show God, to prove to God, like I was trying to preach on Sunday, that you love him. And that's what the trial of your faith is. God's trying your faith. How much do you love me? Do you love me more than your rights? Do you love me more than having the sense of security and control in your life? Do you love me more than your popularity? Do you love me more than your relationships? Do you love me more than your physical safety? Do you love me more than your false idea or whatever you think about me that's not right? I mean, there's a lot. Do you, do you love me more than your own life? I mean, this is the hardest, to me, this is the hardest teaching that there is in the New Testament. And it's in, it's in Matthew, it's in Mark, I believe it's in Luke. <coughs> because this is what a true disciple of the Lord has to deal with. You have to deal with because this is what we love to talk about, right? We love to talk about when I got saved, things changed. The new man 
came on, right? But what we don't like to talk about is the old man had to die. There should have been a death. And a lot of times what we do is we take on the new man, but man, we try to drag, drag part of that old man along with us along the way. But there has to be an act of death that happens, and there has to be a putting on of the new man, which is sanctification. The old has to die, the new has to come on. And this theme is throughout the New Testament. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Mortify. Let me go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, verse 5. Um, there's a section there. I'm not going to read it tonight for time's sake, but there, there's a section there that talks about this very, this very thing, about a, a dying. In the Ephesian letter, he, he references mortifying the deeds of the flesh. Um, there, there are several places that the Apostle Paul talks about this, but there's a denial that has to play. You have to tell yourself no. I don't like that. I don't like to tell myself no. You know what I like to tell myself? You deserve this. Ah, yes, you deserve it. And then I can fill in the blanks about why I deserve it. You know, I'm a hard worker. And I've, you know, sacrificed this or that. And all these justifications in my carnal mind, in my carnal mind about why I should do what I want to do instead of telling myself, no, this is not the right work for what God wants. Go ahead. I kind of like not to take off and too much and preach right now, but he brings up the cross. One, he brings up that, like, they have to bring up to uh, bear the cross. And so that's back to that 11 of the carnal, they're looking at, oh, we got to bear a cross, we got to go die. But it's also the spiritual bearing the bearing cross, not on yourself. And then just the fact that he kind of, like, gives that foreshadowing that it's the cross that I'm going to be dying on, too. You know, even before all this went down, I kind of like that, just all of it kind of coming together there, too. Well, right, and it's kind of like, it's just like this idea that I was trying to say, you know, uh, the Lord gives you so much to prove his love, and now he wants you to give back to prove your love, right? Not to get saved. You're not going to get, you don't get saved, but you're just proving to him that you love him. And, and, the, and the, the, the great part is, is even if you fail in that, he still takes you on to heaven, which is amazing to me. But we don't want to fail in that, right? We don't want to fail in that because this is the work he has for us to do is to tell ourselves no and um, let him deny, deny himself and take up his cross. So here's the second part. Deny yourself and then take up your cross. So you're supposed to carry your cross daily, it says in one place. And of course, we know what happens on a cross, as Brother, Brother Andrew said. That's where people die. So you're supposed to take up a cross, which means... You're carrying something that is, so there's parts of you that are dying every single day, or that should be dying. And, uh, I mean, how many times have you heard a man called to preach? And he'll stand up and the first thing he talks about is how long he ran from it. You know, I know guys that ran from it for 20 plus years. I've heard their testimonies. Um, Steve York, I think it was like 25 years that he ran from it. And the moderator of our association, Jeff uh, Moran. I think his was like 20 years and he ran from the Lord's uh, calling to preach. Why do men run from their calling to preach? Why do they run from their calling to preach? Because what's the first thing you better do if you're going to accept the Lord's role for you in life? You're going to have to tell yourself no. It's the very first thing you got to do. You got to say no. You wanted to, you wanted to, to, um, I don't know what you want to do. Have a career? You might have to tell yourself no about that career. It might not be what God wants. You say, I want, to, I want to live where I grew up my whole life and raise my kids there. And I want a big old house and all that. You might have to tell yourself no about that because that's not what God wants. We could go on and on and on. I have hobbies. I have family. I've got all this stuff I want to do with my life. And you've got to tell yourself no. To surrender to the will. When you got saved... Whether you realize it or not, you surrendered your will to God. In other words, you said, God, if you'll save me and make me one of yours, I'll tell you yes. I promise, I'll tell you yes. And then what do most of us do? We lie. We lie or we, or we struggle. 
Right? And we felt good about it in the minute moment, but then the first time God comes along and says, I want you to do this for me, it's going to challenge you, it, it, you're going to have to, uh, you, might be, you might be unpopular, I want you to talk to your coworker. I want you to talk to your boss, I want you to talk to uh, your, your great aunt that was so mean to you growing up, and you know that one you just really didn't want to be around very much, I want you to talk to that one. And you're like, oh no, no God. But I promised I would tell you yes. That's what I promised. But then when I came down to it, I told you no. And then what? You get the reproof of the Holy Spirit. I mean, because the Holy Spirit just convicts you about that. And then you got a choice to make. You either repent and you follow after what God wants you to do and say yes. Or you harden your heart. You, you, you get obstinate and resistant. You harden your heart. And then the next time the Lord comes to you, you harden it some more. And then that's a bad spot to be in for a Christian, right? So take up your cross. What does that mean? So everybody gets a cross to bear. Everybody. Nobody's exempt from a cross. Nobody. Can't be a Christian without carrying a cross and crucifying things. At least you want to serve the Lord. So what's the cross? What's your cross? I mean, for the preacher, it's kind of easy, right? It's kind of easy to, to say what his cross is. The preacher has to carry the gospel. He has to preach the gospel. He goes and, and does the best he can to pastor churches, try to help people in different areas. You know, uh, that's his cross to carry. And, uh, you know, if you're a parent, certainly part of your cross to carry is the uh, raising your children in the nurture and admonition of Christ. What a job that is. There's a cross to carry for you. The sacrifices that come with that. I mean, what else? Anybody else? What you got a cross? Something you want? Some people have health issues, right? And so then they have to they have to try to keep a positive attitude and trust the Lord with their future, even though they're struggling with their personal health. And that's difficult. That's difficult to serve the Lord with a health problem and to continually give the anxieties and the pain and the difficulties of that health problem over to God every day. Lord, I'm trusting you with this. I'm trusting you with this. I'm trusting you with this. Of course, the widow, the widow has their own cross to bear. The orphan has their own cross to bear. You know, uh, those that come with broken homes, they have their own cross to bear. I mean, there's all kinds of crosses to bear. And the, the key is, is being able to serve the Lord and with a positive, joyful attitude despite difficulty and hardship. Because that's where the witnessing takes place. The witnessing takes place in the joy and the hardship. This is difficult, man. This stinks, really. Uh, but God is helping me. God is helping me. And I praise him for it. And I love him for it. And I'm thankful for his help and his care and his compassion and all that. Take up your cross. What's your cross? Anybody want to share their cross? One of their crosses? It's awfully personal, I know. But what's a cross? What cross are you carrying every day? I think my, my health issue. I mean, up until I turn 70, man, I'm working five miles a day. And it's hard. And all of a sudden, I can't do part of anything. Yeah, but, but you know what I always say? There's always people that's worse off than I am. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's worse off than I am. I can do it. And, and church members, we, we look at a situation like this and we say we have compassion on that because if each one of us lives long enough, we'll have what? We'll have the same issues, right? We're all going to have health issues at some point. We live long enough, we're going to have health issues. Go ahead. Well, kind of along the same lines, it's just uh, you, you reach a point in your life and you realize you're growing old and the aging process is uh, very daunting. And it's tough to be in a position in life when you know as the years go by, you're not going to get smarter, you're not going to get faster, you're not going to get the help. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you've reached that moment where you're going downhill, maybe slowly, but you're going downhill. And it isn't going to get really better. The best you can hope for is maybe next year, I'm kind of status quo with where I am this year. Yeah. And, and, but you're looking down the road. As you look down the road 10, 15 years, it's not easy to be positive. But you know, you're not going to be younger and faster and smarter and better. You're just not. No. That takes a toll mentally. Well, and I would think, too, you get to the point where you know, you know for sure. Like, I've been here longer than I'm going to be here. Right, right. You know, I, I don't have... 
I don't have a lot of time left. I don't know what I have left, but I don't have much. And the older you get, the faster it goes. It does. <laughs> you know, it, it was, it's terrible. All of a sudden, I thought fine. I had all this time, and now I'm going over 78 years old. And where did that time go? So the whole population ages, right? The whole population ages and deals with the same things that we're talking about. And what does that produce in a lot of people? Anger. Anger? Bitterness. Depression? Bitterness? Anxiety? Anxiety? Fear. Fear? All these things. So what a great opportunity for God's people to embrace the same thing everybody else is going at going experiencing but to do it with joy knowing that number one i have a friend that's taking closer to brother that's going to help me throughout this life who has promised to never leave me nor forsake me and then also to know that even when i get to the end whether it's today tomorrow or 10 years from now 50 years from now it doesn't matter when i get there i'm going home i got something better i'm not the atheist who just has nothing or the grave I am a Christian, saved by grace, blood-bought by the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm possessed by Him. Uh, I'm owned by Him. He's got the title to my soul, and He's taken me to His place. That's where I'm going. And to revel in that. And one day I'm getting a new body. This is not the body that I'm going to have forever. I know that's easier said than done. I know that. I know that. This is not an easy thing to do. If it was easy... It wouldn't require faith. Go ahead. Because if you're not willing to take up the cross and try to handle it the way God wants you to, you leave so much joy on the table. Like you're talking about the description of the person who comes up to God and they, he tells them something and they say no, and they harden their heart and they harden their heart. Well, then you have a loss of fellowship, you have a loss of joy. You don't get to have the fruits of the spirit like you should. And yeah, you might get your right to yourself, but what good is that? Well, like once you've tasted of salvation, you've tasted of who the Lord is, mm -hmm. that's what you want. You'll, you'll, and you know as a saved person, like I, I have some experience with this, you know as a saved person, like you can go try and do whatever, but you'll never be as happy as you were when you were in fellowship with the Lord. So you just beat your head up against the wall until you finally submit to whatever it is that God wants you to do. Well, his way. well, and if you don't take up your cross, then you as a Christian, as a saved person, you get to suffer even more because then you have the fear, anxiety, anger, frustration, all the stuff that all the lost people have. You have the very same thing. And then you try to explain to them that, oh, hey, you need salvation. I'm saved. And it's different when you're saved. Is it? How is it different if you're not taking up your cross? It doesn't appear to be different. They have big problems too. I mean, with their kids, some of them are just you know, hung up on drugs, strung out on drugs. Uh, some of them have children that, you know, have problems. They have the same problems we do. Sometimes they just uh, cover it up better and they just have more money. But their money doesn't mean anything. Your money does not mean nothing until you, if, if you don't have enough. You, you spend it all. You save and save and save, and then you spend it trying to get well. Well, well, there's lots of them that had lots of money that committed suicide for yes. apparently no reason. I mean, you see them just kill themselves in their early 30s and 40s and some of these singers and whatnot that it's like you're healthy, you're young, you're famous, you know, you, you had a family. But none of that, none of that solved the issue down inside right. of missing Jesus. Go ahead. Speech and I'd say general attitude too. General attitude. Brother Jason, I think um, through your lifetime you have a lot of crosses to bear. Not just, you know, at the end of life or certain times. Um, crosses to bear when my, when my dead was sick and just said there was no hope. That was 
was a cross I had to bear. Um, being in the military and skip going off overseas. Absolutely. That gave me a cross to bear. And um, just different times. I think we have different crosses. And, you know, um, like he said, he, he lays down his cross for us. And I think through that, it helped me to lay down my cross for him. And, um, you know, I, I had to be good attitude for Ty. He always, every morning it was like, where's daddy? When's daddy coming home? And I had to, you know, that was a cross I had to bear every morning to try to explain to him what was going on. So uh, I know I've had a lot of crosses in my life, but um, I'm thankful that through, through Jesus Christ and what he did for me, those crosses I was able to take care of and handle and move on and keep moving forward to that goal that we always, that we're all searching for and going towards, and that's, uh, you know, heaven. And it j just makes a difference. You have to handle each cross you get the best you can with God's help. Yeah. And I think he'll get you through each and every one of them. Well, the more you go through, too, you can look back and say, well, he got me through that. Mm -hmm. He's going to get me through this, too. Yes. You know, but my sister, uh, she, she went through so much, and I know Cora has, too. My sister, Noma, she lost her husband at 50 years old. Um, he was 50 also. Um, a, a crook, financial person, took all her money. After he died, she got some insurance, took all her money. Um, her son killed himself. Oh boy. Um, you know, I mean, she just went through so many things. And her own health, she had a stroke and everything. And after, she, uh, when she had the last stroke, and she wasn't gonna come out of it, the doctor said, you know, she wasn't gonna make it through this. Um, I had to go to the bank to get something notarized, and I went into it, and they told me to go into this office. And I didn't know this person at all. I'd never seen her before. And she's looking through the paperwork, and she's like, Naoma, cracky up. And she was getting all upset, and I said, yeah. And she said, oh my gosh. She said, I can't believe it. She had tears coming down her face, and she, and she was a person that worked at Naoma's bank. And Naoma, and she talked about God all the time, and she gave, Naoma gave her all this information and everything like that, and she was absolutely crying because my sister was dying. And my sister had gone through all this, but yet she talked to everybody about God. And they saw everything she had been through. And they, you know, they listened to her because she had been through all this, but she still talked about God all the time to everybody, witnessed to everybody, gave them books. I don't care where she went. And, um, you know, that, that just shows you that when you have God, you know, you could get through things. Amen. I think a lot of times, too, we go through a lot, but we have to be forgiven, you know, towards others. Mm -hmm. We have to forgive. I mean, I have a friend that, well, she doesn't mind I was, and she did, towards the end of she didn't, didn't really treat us all so well. She kind of ignored us. But I said, you know, now she has dementia, and when I go to Florida, I go over there and help take care of her. And I know what she did, but I don't hold any of that against her. And, and she was saved. But she's not living the life now. But now she has dementia, and you know she'll call me and say, "Are you in Michigan or are you in Florida?" And I said, "No, Dad, I'm in Michigan." So she, she knows, but I don't hold the things that because we were good friends. We all three were good friends, and she just kind of ignored us and took off. But I forgive her for that. I'm not, I'm still going to go over and take care of her. I do what I'm telling them. I do everything I can for her. Amen. But we have to be forgiven towards other people. Amen. Amen. Yeah, our crosses, we have them every day of our Christian life. Yes. And our lives change and our crosses might change. Sometimes your crosses don't change. But, I mean, we have, I mean, what, what a compassion. When you think about how difficult your cross or your crosses have been, what, what compassion it should breed in us toward other people, right? We have people that, you know, single parents, I mean, what a cross to bear. People that have uh, disabled children, what a cross to bear. I mean, people struggling with health, what a cross to bear. I mean, there are so many people with crosses to bear, and, 
God would be very compassionate for us to, to deal with them, knowing that, hey, the crosses are difficult. They're difficult. We've got somebody doing them. Amen. If they weren't diff like I say, if we, they weren't difficult, we wouldn't need the Lord. That's right. We, we think we did it all. We don't need. But, but you gotta, you gotta cast your cares on Him. Yes. You got to. Okay, I appreciate you guys sharing tonight. Sorry, Denise. The part that's hardest, when I think of it, is all these, all the works that you can do for the Lord and the things that He wants you to do for Him. But the bottom line is. And Kind of already touched on it is if you do it out of obligation and you do it because you think you should, you're not going to get the blessings. And then you have to do it because you really 